And hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Let's Keep Chatting with the Vice and our qualities. My name is Lisa, and this is Elric. Hi there, hello. Hi, and we have Helen uh, today from Include Me. Good morning. Good morning, Helen. <laughs> uh, this podcast is all about talking to community groups and organisations uh, dealing with uh, equality groups and, and protected characteristics and how they've been coping during the current COVID-19 pandemic and how poverty has also affected people within the area of Fife. So Helen, uh, could you give us a little bit of a background about Include Me, please? I can. Thank you very much for having me along this morning. I never turned down an opportunity to talk about our organisation. Include Me is a citizen advocacy organisation. Um, we operate within North East Fife and we work with adults aged 16 to 65 who fall within one of our referral criteria. Now, they are individuals with learning or physical disability, people who may be on the autistic spectrum, um, individuals with mental health issues or early onset dementia, people with long term health conditions um, and anyone really who may be termed vulnerable um, with regard to their need for extra help and support. Citizen advocacy is a very unique form of advocacy in that what we do, myself and my colleague as development workers, is we recruit, train and support volunteers to become citizen advocates. And what that means is a citizen advocate is matched with an individual and they support them to have their voice heard, to be active participants in their own lives and in the decisions that are being made about them. So, for example, a citizen advocate might support someone at a care programme meeting to ensure that their opinions are being heard, that their wishes are being heard and that they're being taken into account, especially by statutory services. So that's, that's where the distinction between, let's say, a carer and a, a citizen advocate would be. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a different approach, if you want. I think so. I mean, where there is always room for the carer's opinion and the carer's support. Mm -hmm. Citizen advocacy is independent and without prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, so a citizen advocate is there solely to represent the interests of the person they are matched with. And however much carers do this, and they do it very well most of the time, mm -hmm. they also have their own needs to consider. Yeah. A citizen advocate afford someone the opportunity to have someone coming in very much with no prejudices, with no particular opinions on what's best for them um, and to support them to try and achieve that. How, how do you get um, the people to trust, you know, the people that you're pairing them up with? That's a really good question, Lisa, because trust is something that we often find our advocacy partners have lost, especially mm -hmm. in the people in their lives. Most of the people who come into the lives of our advocacy partners are paid to be there. They're, and that includes myself and my colleague. We are funded by Five Council. So our involvement with our advocacy partners comes with the fact that we have a salary at the end of a month. Trust develops when the partner realises that the advocate they are matched with is choosing to be in their life for no other reason than they want to be there and they want to help and support them. The matching process itself is long and detailed and we offer as much support as we can. In the early stages, when we have a referral for someone who might need an advocate, we go out and visit them and find out as much as we possibly can about that person. And then what we do is we recruit an advocate for them. We don't have a little drawer of advocates that we pull out and, and match. We would then go and find, so if a partner, for example, loved animals and walking, we would go out and recruit someone who liked animals and walking. So they had things in common 
Um, mm. And we find that's often the best way to start the relationship. So we have a, an advocacy partner who, for example, loves things gothic, the nightmare before Christmas, Halloween, mm -hmm. um, and they are matched with a young person, a student actually, who is very much into the same things and they share the same interests in books and movies. And that's always a really good start for trust to be built. The trust also develops when people meet their obligations, that they are honest about what they can offer. And you have to remember our advocates are volunteers. So we always say to them in the early stages, never overcommit and then not be able to follow through. Yeah. We ask that our volunteers are available for two to three hours every month to meet with their advocacy partner or to have contact with them. Any less in a relationship can't develop. If they want to do more, that's fine, but don't raise a partner's hopes that they're going to see their advocate every week, only for them a couple of months down the line to go, oh, we can't sustain this anymore. Um, so yeah, trust is a, a complicated and convoluted thing, but it comes because the partnership is supported to develop by myself and my colleague. Mm. Very interesting. So tell us a bit of the, the history of Include Me and how you, you were formed or... Citizen uh, Advocacy um, came about not strangely at all in America. It is an American movement. Mm -hmm. And it came about because a conference was held in the latter years of the 1960s by a group of parents with the very catchy and very non-PC title of what will happen to my handicapped child when I die. Mm -hmm. But this was because parents had got together and were terrified that their child who had needs um, was going to be unable to live in a way that they were supported and cared for. Mm -hmm. um, so the citizen advocacy <laughs> movement developed in America from the idea of almost community responsibility for those who were most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Very much a Victorian attitude towards caring for wider communities. Mm -hmm. It moved over to Britain in the latter part of the 1970s and in Fife, it has developed because what we have is actually quite a forward thinking council in that they look at funding advocacy that meets the needs of a variety of individuals in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. So citizen advocacy is only one form of advocacy that's available to people in Fife mm -hmm. and is a complementary form. Um, there are three citizen advocacy organisations in Fife that are split geographically. So one for the West, one for Central and ourselves in the North East. Mm -hmm. um, we've been going now for just over 12 years. Our longest partnership just celebrated their 10 year anniversary last week, wow. um, which wow. is That's a massive great. milestone. Yeah. Um, and our sister organisations who have both been around for longer than we have done Fermlin, for example, is well into their 20 odd year and they have partnerships mm. that are nearly 20 years wow. in the matching. Um, as I say, Fife Council has always been quite forward thinking. Citizen advocacy is not something that's offered throughout Scotland. Mm -hmm. We have a, a small citizen advocacy network where we all get together and there are the three organisations in Fife, one from Angus, a worker from Dundee and occasionally an online contact with someone in Highland. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that is available across the board. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. So you so you mainly work in the North East of Fife and um, do you have a specific group that you will uh, match with or basically you would you be like open to anyone in the North East area that, that would need someone to actually have uh, that approach of someone advocating for them? We, up until 2014, include me and the other citizen advocacy services only worked with individuals with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. In 2014, Fife published their new advocacy strategy. And at that point, the criteria for 
access to advocacy within citizen advocacy widened massively. Um, as I, I, I said at the beginning, we, we cover mental health, physical um, disability, learning disability, ESD, early onset dementia and long term health conditions. Um, and to be fair, there are very few people who are referred to us that we cannot work with mm. because unless it's geographical or age based, it, interestingly enough, out with Northeast Fife, we will refer people on to our sister organisations. We don't work with under 16s because child mm -hmm. advocacy is a very specialised area. Mm -hmm. And over 65s, we are not funded to work with. If somebody's involved with our service and they hit 65, we can continue to work with them. But currently, as things stand, we can't take referrals for people over 65. Wow. Um, and that's just historically the way we've been funded. We are ostensibly an adult service. We're always looking at how we might be able to develop, but we are a small organisation staffed by two part-time development workers. Um, wow. <laughs> so it's, yeah. capacity can be an issue. Yeah, definitely. So That must be a lot of pressure though, just being like two of you is, doing the part-time work and then having volunteers come in, you know, sort of in and out, you know, to help you. Is. We have Camilla, who's my colleague and I, um, each work with nine or 10 partnerships. We currently have 19 partnerships mm -hmm. on our books. We are also in the process of training four new advocates. Wow. Um, who will complete their training after Christmas and hopefully be matched into the spring. You're right, Lisa, there's a lot of pressure on us because we it's not only about supporting the partnerships we have, we're supposed to recruit new advocates mm -hmm. to match the people who are referred to us. We're supposed to raise awareness of the organisation, so doing things like this. Um, we're supposed to also look at sourcing other sources of funding. Um, 24 hours a week I work, as does my colleague. Um, and it, it can be, by Christmas we're needing our break, trust me. Oh yeah, probably there are people that's going to con contemplate the break at the end of the year, <laughs> especially. So yeah, it's been it's been quite a trek since March for most of us, I think. Um, so. How's things been since since the, uh, the first lockdown for you? How, how, how have things been? We, without trying to sell ourselves as Mystic Megs, we kind of saw it coming. Um, we were looking, the week before lockdown, we were preparing for what might happen. Yeah. Um, and because we are working with an awful lot of vulnerable individuals, we had to look very quickly at how we continued to support partnerships. Mm. It wasn't just our advocacy partners that were vulnerable, we also have some elderly advocates who then had to self-isolate for 12 weeks. Okay. Um, so initially what we did was send out information that we were no longer working from the office and obviously we could no longer have face-to-face -face meetings, but tried to have as contact with as many people as possible to find out the best way to sustain contact with them, whether it be email, whether it be telephone. Um, the difficulties came with our partners who have profound learning disabilities and who struggle with non-face-to-face -face communication and, and verbal communication com completely. Mm -hmm. um, we had to find ways very quickly of trying to ensure that either advocates or us could keep contact with people where necessary. Mm -hmm. We were quite lucky in that <clears throat> we submitted a funding application to St Andrews Community Trust, which was successful and which enabled us to buy tablet computers mm -hmm. that we were able to give to our advocacy partners who lived in the St Andrews area to help them have Skype contact with their advocates. Their advocates yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a successful Connecting Scotland bid, so we got five iPads that we were able to hand out to people 
further afield from St Andrews. But very interestingly, what we have found is that people have very, very definite attitudes towards technology and whether or not they want to use that as a means. And I think while there is a huge amount of digital exclusion and digital poverty, what we also need to take into account that there are, in our case, partners and advocates who do not like using technology for contact mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. We have some partners who are very suspicious of the idea of having communication across the ether and who might be looking in and mm -hmm. you know making sure it's Obviously, not being recorded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have advocates who are tech phobic and really don't want to and have to use things like Skype or Teams or Near Me or Zoom. Um, so we've had to be really quite flexible mm -hmm. in how we adapt. Some of our advocates have have res gone back to doing things like sending cards and writing letters because they feel that that will also help boost their partner if they get a letter mm -hmm. that someone can read to them or they can read themselves. I'm just thinking that did your advocates have to like step in as a, a communication link for a lot of people uh, in some ways because <laughs> that I guess that's part of advocacy to be able to communicate. It, a lot of people are actually out of communication loop. That's even before we had the lockdown. So I don't know. Have, have you noticed anything? That... What was very interesting was obviously it was so new and so different to everyone that people turned inwards and looked to us for right. guidance. Mm -hmm. um, what we very early on tried to do, especially for our advocacy partners who were living, say, in residential mm -hmm. accommodation, was to try and find accessible information for them about what was happening. Right. So, for example, um, information about COVID, information about what would happen to ho if they were admitted to hospital, mm -hmm. was not immediately readily available. Um, yeah, it wasn't, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And it was difficult enough for people who on the whole tend to be able to assert their opinions. Um, but for some of our partners, they were terrified that they would be admitted to hospital and no one would be able to support them or help them. Um, and in the early stages, that's, mm. that's what happened. We were lucky in that none of our partners have required hospitalisation due to COVID. But what we did do was ensure that they had information around that could be shared with hospital staff. So people with learning disabilities often have what's called a hospital passport. So oh, if they're admitted to hospital, mm -hmm. there's things like what medications they take, whether or not they need support to eat, how they best communicate. Mm -hmm. NHS Tayside fairly early on created effectively what is a codicil to this passport around COVID okay. um, because at that point no one was being allowed in with anyone if they were admitted to hospital. Ah, right. Um, yeah. So what we did try and do was to push the idea that someone, especially an individual with perhaps a mental health issue or a learning disability, might require someone with them to ensure that they weren't Mm. ignored in decisions being made about their care. Lost. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like DNR forms. Definitely. That was a big issue. It still is in some ways. Yeah. <coughs> that still is definitely <clears throat> isn't very clear uh, how it was handled and how to handle it correctly as well. So is that something that advocates get involved in or is it uh, technically? They can do. Um, I mean, we historically what we've always said with regard to our partnerships is if advocates are unavailable or unwell or can't actively be involved with their partner for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that myself or my colleague will step in and pick up pieces sure. of work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, my colleague recently did a sterling piece of work to ensure that some of our partners who live in supported accommodation 
were able to get their flu jab without actually having to leave the premises, which is what they've been told they would have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so she did a lot of work to ensure. And because it's a, a residential unit, but not for elderly people, they kind of fall between two stools. They, yeah. they are at the top of the list for testing, for flu jags, that sort of thing. So Camilla did a lot of work with support from counsellors um, and other professionals to ensure that our partners and by extension other people living in the supported accommodation would have access to proper health care. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, see how you were just talking about how they wouldn't have to leave their residential home to go and get, say, the flu jab or anything. With the vaccine now getting put out there, would they be covered? Like, because I was watching the news how care homes, they were going to take it to them kind of thing to help them. So would that be in the same situation for people that are in residential homes that are needing that extra support? That's something that we are currently working on. Um, because again, most of our partners, because they are not over 65, don't immediately ah. fall into the very vulnerable group as far mm. as the criteria that the government have, have stated. Um, however, because the work has been done around the flu vaccine, we're hoping with, again, the support that we had from, from some counsellors and from other professionals to ensure that people living in that kind of accommodation aren't discounted or ignored. Mm -hmm. um, because they are as vulnerable and in some cases because they have underlying physical health issues mm -hmm. more vulnerable than the rest of us. Definitely. But that's like, <clears throat> it's, it's something that we seem to have had quite a lot in uh, the podcast. Uh, we talked about it. It's like, we, there's a lot of groups uh, and communities and, and service users that because it's been ticking quite nicely before we, we, we don't really speak about them as such. We did, it's not until really the impact of COVID came in that actually people really started to realize, actually, they are being left out of a, a, of a information loop. They, they're being left out of a, actually paying attention to what's happening loop kind of thing. And uh, so that's something that, I don't know, uh, <laughs> It's not as if it was not there before, but it's really put the focus on it now. I think uh, how uh, we had some people with communication difficulties, with um, impairment, like sensory impairment, physical impairment, learning dis uh, disability, that didn't really uh, understand what was going on <laughs> to start with, and then how to deal with it, and have someone to actually uh, translate it uh, to, to, to be a to, to be able to actually adjust the services in the way that actually makes sense. So that's really good. So that's that, that seems to be like the, the central thing that you've been working at with uh, advocates. Um, I think so. I think what, if anything, this has highlighted again is that services in their involvement, especially with people with learning disabilities, and perhaps those across the, the wider protected characteristics, tend to act reactively rather than proactively. Mm. So it's only when an issue arises that they feel they have to deal with it. So to give an example, earlier this year, tail end of last year, my colleague and I was lo were looking to source information for young women with learning disabilities about um, health screening around cervical cancer and you know, breast screening, that sort of thing. And we could find nothing that was available in easy read for people who required it. Um, other than a leaflet on some obscure English health service website that was um, aimed at people with learning disabilities. And we, we work quite actively to try and make sure that information is available so that our advocates can support their partners to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think what's come out from COVID, there is some very good easy read information about the pandemic, about mm -hmm. how to, you know, what tiers are and, and how to act. Mm -hmm. Unlike everything else, 
for the rest of us, it is reactive because that's the way the pandemic is, is working. You cannot mm -hmm. proactively produce information because things change so quickly. Mm -hmm. But I think what has been highlighted for us is again, people who are often afraid to ask what's happening or why things are happening are being ignored. Mm. Um, and it's only, it's reliant on support services, especially those within the third sector, to provide the information so that people can either become less anxious, because anxiety is a massive thing out there at the moment, um, can access the financial support they may need, because mm. that's another issue, um, and can know how to behave, so know, know when they can go out, when they can't. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue that we have been made very aware of was how quickly services just vanished off the face of the earth. You know, there was lockdown, day centres closed, so mm -hmm. people were then at home. On the whole, people were not immediately offered alternative services, so you then had extra pressure on carers. Mm -hmm. who suddenly found their adult dependent at home with them 24-7 oh, wow. mm -hmm. yeah. um, and whose levels of anxiety and stress have risen you know, alongside that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That, that, that's something that in some ways it had to happen. It's just it, it showed how fragile the, the setup was <laughs> already and, it's, and how vital it was in, in many ways for, all, for a lot of folk there. Um, we we did notice, I mean, we, we collect that. This is not just to make a FC kind of advert kind of thing, but we, we've started collecting a lot of easy read information, the translated information that was coming on and all that. And uh, it was good to see so much of it in some ways. And you'll be like, gosh, I wish, I, I wish that would happen without having the pandemic going on in the background. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really yeah. good to have all this, you know? And, and uh, so... So yeah, so in some ways it's it's um, it's connected more people to think about the different groups and, and the, where they are, their needs, the, the limits that they have to deal with in every day. Um, but yeah, it's 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 definitely so much work still to be done. So so what? So so you're seeing? I think everyone can definitely see that the anxiety has gone like through the roof uh, the past few months. That's definitely there. But is there any patterns you, you noticed? Things that you really picked up through? maybe feedback through your partners or payers, things that they, they, they tell again and again, this is something that's, yeah. We have to I think with. for us, the biggest, one of the biggest issues around anxiety, and it was both from advocates and partners, was the lack of clarity hmm? or the conflicting information that was being offered. Um, social media is a wonderful thing in its purest form, but it's often the go-to source of information for our, our partners especially. And there is no, some sites will take down what they know to be false information or harmful information, but there's so much more gets through that mm. they won't take down. So we have partners who aren't sure about the whole vaccine thing because there's all the anti-vaccine information. Okay. Um, they also were, weren't entirely sure, especially in the early stages of the pandemic, because nobody knew exactly what was happening, but they had no single source to go to for information. And we found often our partners and our advocates, again, turn and look back to us to try and source clear no sense of the sense of a chaos of yeah. stuff, yeah, pictures of cats and and real information behind it. Yeah, that yeah. that's the thing, and also it's when it's something that they are concerned about other people. So we've had partners who've said, you know, I'm okay, but I, I'm frightened that my my mum will get this or mm -hmm. the people who come in and provide support for me what what if i give them covid and should mm -hmm. i just not be seeing people um so a lot of what we do has been reassurance around the idea that anxiety is okay it's all right mm -hmm. not to know what's happening it's all right to be anxious um but not 
to do it in a way that isolates yourself further from your community and those around you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's been the other thing. Um, lockdown, isolation has sure. caused an awful lot of people an awful lot of stress. Um, again, going back to the some of our partners who attended day centres mm -hmm. still contact our organisation every day in tears because they have they can't see their friends, they don't know what's happening mm -hmm. um, and their lives as they've known it for decades in some cases because it's been decades they've attended day centres with the same people they've grown up with mm -hmm. have changed immeasurably and they they are frightened for the future. Has there been any like good examples of how to deal with isolation that you've you've you've, you've picked up on because that's it is something that we've heard a lot still well there's a lot of hoops on the vaccine but we know it's going to take a while to roll out and even that people still have to be safe anyway to, take, to be safe about uh, the next few months and the isolation is definitely something that we've heard a lot so it, as, as you found any ways to have worked around with it we it, it's very much <laughs> without sort of slipping into jargon, we've had to keep it as person-centred as possible. Okay. We obviously have to operate within health and safety guidelines and we are guided by Fife Council as to what we perhaps should and shouldn't be doing. But we also have to take into account that for some people a phone call or a text once every couple of weeks from us is enough to keep them going. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, for other people, they require a bit more support. Um, sometimes the support we're offering, albeit on an ad hoc basis, is a little bit of support and reassurance to people's carers to help mm. them support the people they're living with. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I Isolation has become the norm and that's a bit worrying. Mm -hmm. But often people don't see the light at the end of this. And we've worked so hard for so many years to re-engage people with their communities and communities are now fractured and broken, perhaps not on an emotional or supportive level, because we've seen throughout the pandemic how well communities have come together to support each other. Definitely. Um, but we still have people who were isolated and perhaps living on the fringes of communities for many years because of a learning disability or a mental health issue, who perhaps feel that it's going to be difficult to start all over again and re-engage. Hmm. Um, so we're going to have a role, I think, with our advocates to ensure that people don't hmm. get left behind when we move forward from this. So it's like recreating some kind of peer group and connections, you mean? What's, Very much yeah. so. Mm -hmm. it, to ensure that they're not an afterthought. Mm -hmm. They're not just people perhaps to deliver groceries to or to make sure they get their medicine, mm -hmm. but they're people who need to have meaningful connections with other mm -hmm. folk in their community. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We, we've been well, kind of... With... Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, what kind of like extra help that you'd be looking for, you know, to during the current situation and, you know, in the future that you might still need? We always need new volunteers, always. Um, there is a limitless amount of people who need someone to help them move forward in a way that they want to, to achieve what they would like and to have the sort of life that they shouldn't feel isn't available to them because of of their disability or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so volunteers, very much so. Um, I think on a wider level, Lisa, it's very much about a societal attitude towards people who are put away in little boxes often and forgotten about. That we need, at the core of citizen advocacy is a sense of community responsibility for everyone in that community. Whatever their gender, their needs, their whatever. And I think 
we need to see this pandemic as an opportunity for communities to be as inclusive as they can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without it becoming tokenistic, without it becoming something that is held up as being, look at us, we're doing something special. It has to become the norm, mm -hmm. not the mm -hmm. outside normal. And I think we as as a citizen advocacy organisation, that drives us. That's what drives our advocates. It's what drives us as development workers. So we definitely do a call out to recruit your, your new advocates for doing this. So can you tell a bit more about what would it take for volunteers? Uh, how much training does it take? How do you do it? Uh, how, how to get involved? Where to sign up? Da, 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 da. So, so we can really like, spread the message around. Certainly. I think initially what I need to say, because the word advocacy sometimes scares people. They hear the word advocate and they see somebody in a robe and a wig standing in a courthouse. And advocacy is not about that. <laughs> um, advocacy is about helping people have a voice. I think what is important is that advocacy is something that we all have the potential to do. People have a variety of skills and experiences that mean they can improve the life of someone they are matched with. Yeah. Our volunteers, 16 upwards. Um, we don't have an upper age limit, but 16 is the lowest. I think our youngest volunteer at the moment is 19. Um, it's helpful if they live in North East Fife because we can match someone to them quite locally then. It's helpful if they can give us two to three hours a month because any less than that, as I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to build a relationship. Um, normally our recruitment process involves the completion of an application, the provision of two referees that we take up references from. All our advocates have to undertake PVG screening, so protecting vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. We ask they complete the online module that Fife Council provide on adult protection. And what we do is we offer a two session preparation course that covers things like confidentiality, um, boundaries, working with families and, and other professionals. Once a partnership is matched, we then do a training needs analysis. So if an advocate is matched with someone, for example, with uh, a mental health issue, we try and source maybe mental health first aid for them. Mm -hmm. We can source training on self-harm, on self-esteem, um, on understanding autism, but that's very much based on specific yeah. partnerships and the individual needs there. As development workers, my colleague and I provide support to each partnership. We meet every three months to discuss with the advocate how things are going and we have an annual review where we, we and that's less to do with making sure what the advocate, you know, what they're doing is right mm -hmm. and more a way of demonstrating to them the impact they're having on someone's life um, because our advocates mm -hmm. often feel that they aren't making a difference and it takes someone from the outside to say to them, what you're doing is immense. Our advocates are all heroes. People should be writing songs about them because what they do is just massive. Um, I remember a partnership I supported a few years ago. The advocate was a young student doing his master's at St Andrews and he was matched with a young man who lived locally um, and they actually had more contact with through online gaming. They, they both really enjoyed online gaming, which was a massive learning curve for me because I would just nod and go, hmm, that's nice. <laughs> um, but I remember, and the, because the, the advocate was moving on, obviously, when he finished his master's and a sort of final meeting, I met with him and said, well, how do you think things went? And he went, well, you know, I kind of feel that I've not really done much. I said, well, how do you work that? He said, well, he says, you know, we we got together, we, we did some gaming. We, I suppose I, I helped him pass his theory driving test. Right, okay. Um, and he's going into college. 
I said, oh, he's got into, yeah, I helped him with this application for college and I did some preparation with him for his interview. But he didn't see that as making such a massive difference. It, it mm -hmm. takes us sometimes to say, right, stop, mm -hmm. think, reflect, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and take into account the difference you've made in somebody's life. But there's someone there while you're yeah. doing this, rather than uh -huh. fishing, it, fishing a cliff. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really, <laughs> really good. We, do, do you have a story like that that we can maybe share in the blog, maybe, or, or we can post or you have somewhere? Or we'd be very, we would very be pleased to share it. So I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> we, always, we always have stories. As I've said to you, the what our advocates do makes such a difference to someone else's life. But I think what's very important and what sometimes people don't think about is the amount of times our advocates come back to us and say the impact it's had on their life. Mm -hmm. I met an advocate recently to do a, a sort of quick catch up and they were saying that everything that's going on, the pandemic and they've got so caring duties for dependents and they, they have a full-time job and their life is just so busy. But they said what keeps them going is their partnership. Mm. That they get as much from being with their partner as their partner does from them being in their life. Um, and I think that's part of what makes it work, that it's a mutually beneficial relationship. It's not someone doing something to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's someone being in someone's life and then moving forward together yeah so so how how to apply is it just give you a ring or is it on the website or what how, how do people find out but uh... we have a website um include me and okay. there is a we can people can contact us through the website they can send us an email um our other contact details are there we are a part-time service, so occasionally it will take a few days for us to get back to folk if we're both on days off. Um, we check our answering machine because we're not working from our office full-time at the moment. We're occasionally popping in, but we check our answering machine every day. And if someone's just interested in the organisation, whether it's to be a volunteer, whether it's because they know someone who would benefit from an advocate, Mm -hmm. or whether it's just because they're interested in finding out more. As you can tell, we love talking about what we do. <laughs> We're more than happy to do I've, that. I've said to get that feeling, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good that you like talking about because it, it shows you how, like, the passion that you're having helping these people and getting the word out there about your group and everything, you know, so that others can learn and maybe join in. And everything. Definitely. So I'll make sure to include the, the links as we uh, post the podcast. So yeah, that's really, really great. So, so I don't know. I mean, it's been quite shocking here, but the best thing that we can wish is that you can get your four recruits very soon. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but this, I, I think you're, what, what you're talking about, having a kind of rebirth of community in some ways and connection. Now that's something that, yeah. I think that's definitely a good thing to wish for. <laughs> we'll give you as much support as we can to actually do that. Thank, Thank you. I think the spanner that has now been thrown in the works because we have pandemic mm. and Brexit. We oh, now wow. have pandemic and Brexit, which mm. is is basically just, they're just vying for the headlines on the news at the moment. If it's not one, it's the other. It's which it's more. another thing that's unsettling people. Um, and I think that's also fracturing communities. It's making folk feel unwanted. It's making folk feel excluded. Um, mm. So I think that's not going to help matters in the longer term either. Yeah. It's going to be interesting next year, whichever way you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, that sounds really good. So we'll definitely do that. Thank you for definitely talking about this. And uh, I'll, if you have any posters or things or that you want to share and all that I'll include it in the, the podcast as well but that podcast uh, it's going to go on YouTube so there's subtitles and uh, I'll also type a mini blog with information about the service and uh, citizen advocacy as well and that's great Albert. thanks yeah, yeah definitely that sounds good thank you so much yeah.
thank you for coming along, Helen. Thank you very much for having me, folks. And I'm sorry if I <laughs> talked your ear off. No, 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 definitely not. We love it. That's why we. <laughs> that's why we're on the podcast anyway. So yeah. <laughs> I, I would. I've finished my coffee at least. So but, <laughs> that's 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 for conversation. So no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for this. And you're welcome. Thank you. Take care, folks, and have a lovely Christmas. You too. All the very best. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. Bye. Bye.